And today we're going to be discussing how to accelerate and support the transition to electric vehicles through the lens of both governments and the private sector. Now, through the Race to Zero Breakthrough campaign, we're pushing to get the whole automotive sector on the path to net zero as soon as possible. Um, we think that's possible between 2030 and 2040 for vehicle sales, well before 2050. Uh, and we know this is a sector that can go much faster and the science tells us that we must go as fast as possible. That's why we call it the race to zero. Uh, something that we often talk about, um, Gonzalo Munoz, um, uh, my fellow um, UN climate champion, is the ambition loop. The idea that greater ambition from national governments um, uh, can and in, uh, can promote more ambition from industry um, and more ambition from industry can in turn make it easier for governments to set older policy. So it's a really exciting to have a chance to speak to um, ministers um, from three governments and from CEOs from three parts of the ecosystem as well as some leading civil society voices to see how we can keep that ambition loop spinning faster and faster in the race to zero emission vehicles. Now, to start us off, I'm delighted to be able to introduce a video message from Alok Sharma, who, as I'm sure you all know, is the UK's COP26 president, president designate. He'll take over the presidency at the beginning of the COP in Glasgow in November, and he's going to set the scene for the discussion ahead. Over to Alok. Good afternoon. The future of the road transport sector is clear, and that future is zero emissions. The transition is happening faster than ever before. The pace of zero emissions vehicle sales has been quickening. In the European Union, for example, 10% of the cars sold in 2020 were hybrid or electric. That is expected to rise to 15% this year. In Norway, electric car sales have overtaken petrol and diesel vehicles. And the UK will stop the sale of new petrol and diesel cars by 2030. That matches the ambition shown by the likes of Sweden, Iceland, Denmark, and the Netherlands. Whilst, of course, Norway is set for a 2025 phase out. Manufacturers are taking action too. Volvo will phase out internal combustion engine sales by 2030 and General Motors by 2035. And we know that action from governments and business reinforce one another. So as we look to speed up the transition to green transport, we need action from both groups. And we must speed it up because today, road transport is responsible for 10% of global emissions. To meet the goals of the Paris Agreement, we need all new car sales to be zero emission by 2040. Earlier, in fact, in the most advanced markets. And a faster transition can benefit us all thanks to economies of scale and reducing costs. So to help get the transition moving faster, the UK COP26 presidency established the Zero Emission Vehicles Transition Council. And this brings together ministers and governments representing some of the world's biggest car markets to look at how we can work together. And our work is very much informed by consultations with business and civil society. I hope that your discussions today also help to establish ways to accelerate the move to zero emission vehicles. And I encourage those of you who have not yet done so to make these bold commitments. Commitments that push the world closer towards its clean future. And that help your company, or indeed your country's manufacturers, to get ahead. To capitalise on the now inevitable transition to zero emission road transport around the whole world. So I wish you the best of luck with your discussions and your deliberations. Thank you. Right, well, thanks to Alok for setting the scene so well. Um, he talked about an inevitable and quickening transition. They talked about that, that ambition, the role of governments um, and, and, and the private sector and the crucial role of civil society in informing that. He talked about the landing zone of 2025 to 2040. Um, and, and, and that this is driven not just by climate, but also by health and competitiveness, which I'm sure we'll hear more about. So. Now, for the first session, um, we're going to turn to the role of national governments in the race to zero emissions vehicles. And so I'd like to welcome two ministers from countries that have recently made big, ambitious national commitments to phase out fossil fuel vehicles. Um, firstly, Stintje van Veldhoven, who's the State Secretary for Infrastructure and Water Management from the Government of the Netherlands, which includes transport infrastructure. It's not in the title, but it's very much in the role, I know. Um, and secondly, we'll hear from Rachel McLean, who's the Minister for Transport from the UK government. 
Um, let me let me turn first to Minister Van Veldhoven. Um, Minister, the, the Netherlands is really at the forefront of the ZEV transformation now. You've committed to 2030 combustion engine phase out for cars and, and 2025 for all bus sales. Um, can you just talk us through what brought you to this decision? What were some of the difficult points and what's that, some of the reasons that got you to such an ambitious position? Thanks so much. And uh, great to have this conversation with all of us. I think learning from each other is exactly what we need to do to speed up. And there's, there is a great need for speeding up. So how did we how did we get to these goals? Well, basically, they are not new goals. What we just did is we translated our signature below the Paris Agreement to what would it actually mean for the Netherlands to, um, to fulfill that commitment that we made. And then it's basically simple arithmetics. If you want to be um, uh, carbon neutral, zero emission in 2050, uh, and the average, the, the cars on the road in the Netherlands have an average age or, or stay on the road for about 20 years, then you just need to stop adding new fossil fuel cars to your fleet around 2030. Um, and basically it's an analysis that we made with all the partners that are needed uh, and based on that analysis, we said, okay, then what is what do we need to do to ensure that it becomes attractive enough for people to make that choice in 2030? And of course, market developments and price developments and, and prices of batteries, et cetera, is all very much part of that transition. So the market is a big, big piece of the puzzle. But it's also the joint commitment. So we we made a very clear commitment in our climate agreements that we are on an irreversible path towards low and zero emission transport. Electric zero emission is going to be the new normal for all of us in transport. All vehicles on the road should be zero emission by 2050. Um, and so we took a segmented approach working together with all stakeholders. Uh, and we started with the niches first that are ready first, where the urgency is highest, where the collaboration exists that allows you to move faster. Because once things start rolling, this also provides an example for other sectors on, on how to move forward. And then there is, I think, a crucial element has been right from the start, the co collaboration between both governments uh, uh, and market parties, because they rely on governments to set very clear uh, ambitions, to support those ambitions with legal certainty for them to invest in. And then, of course, what we also try to do was to stay as close to the normal moment of reinvestment as possible so as to minimize, minimize capital loss. And I think the, the structure that we chose was you set a certain date, as from that date, all new vehicles need to be zero emission, but you, you allow for a certain time of, of, let's say, transition for those for which that natural moment of change falls one or two or maybe three years after that, let's say, first cutoff date. But then there needs to be an end date to that transition period too, so that everybody knows that within that time frame of, let's say, three to four years, you will need to make the change. And so if, you're, if the lifetime of your vehicle is about seven years, then you already know that three years before that, let's say, first cutoff date, it makes sense to start thinking about changing to zero emission. Overall, we have a set of very clear goals now. From 2030, we want all new cars sold to be zero emission. 30 to 40 major areas should be zero emission by 2025 with regards to city logistics. And already nearly 20 cities have come forward between, let's say, uh, beginning of this year uh, and now. Um, all public transport buses should be zero emission by 2030, but all new ones need to be zero emission as from 2025. So we allow for, let's say, this phase out period between 2025 and 2030, but any new purchase as from 2025 has to be zero emission. All new target group transport tenders, including school buses and, and special needs transports, should be zero emission by 2030. And we also have agreements with employers to stimulate alternative modes of transport, for example, cycling. Um, and then, of course, we very much realize that as the Netherlands alone, we are not, we do not create enough of, let's say, weight in the market to speed up the development in the market, which is also so crucial to supply sufficient uh, vehicles. Because it's a chicken and egg problem, basically, with 
three partners because there is the chicken, there's the egg, and then there's the nest. Because there is, if there's no charging infrastructure, there's no way either the chicken or the egg will survive. So um, for light duty vehicles like cars and vans, uh, we've also teamed up with, with countries like Denmark, Ireland, Austria, UK, Norway, and advocated for a 2030 target because we also need to see car manufacturers and uh, uh, moving in that direction. Um, so all of this is not really new, but we just said, let, let's keep this commitment. Let's stick to that signature and translate that signature in what we need to do. Um, and I think in the last meeting that you and I talked to Nigel, um, one, of the, one of the elements why this is so crucial is it's, it's not just Europe that needs to decarbonize. The rest of the world needs to be carbonized. Countries where we export our secondhand cars need to decarbonize. And so our, our timeline of decarbonization needs to be synchronized basically with the pathway that the entire world will need to take on decarbonization. Uh, and that is why it is so crucial that in, in Europe, we speed up as much as possible so as to also translate some of those benefits as soon as possible to other parts of the world where they might still be driving in our cars. Um, this has lots of benefits for climate change, uh, combating climate change. It also has massive impacts on air qualities in inner cities. And that is why, why we basically took a, a start from the heart approach. You start from the heart of the city where there's many pedestrians, where there's many cyclists, where you want to, where there's many people living and working and, and commuting all day. Uh, and you want to clean up that air as soon as possible. Also, when you start from the heart, distances are relatively short and it's relatively easy to choose other modes of transport, to choose public transport or to switch to electric. So um, I think our most valuable lesson has been the cooperation. Um, you need to hold hands uh, moving forward step by step because holding hands means that you each give each other the assurance that you are still together on this pathway. Uh, and makes for a joint transition. There are so many uncertainties, that's the one certainty, there are many uncertainties, but if you know that you're holding hands and that your goal is very, very clear because it's the signature under the Paris Agreement that says where you're going, then you can jointly move on this path and try to move as fast as possible. Because delay, because you don't have your partners at the table because there is no trust, delay is our biggest enemy here. The technology is there, it's it's basically it's it's cheaper it's good for air quality all of these elements are there but it's the delay that is our biggest enemy and so by really joining forces you can overcome the delay give each other the certainty needed to make investments and jointly move up and scale up and speed up because that is exactly what we need to do uh, to finalize I think uh, this is more or less what we are what we are thinking about what we are doing uh, but I think the supply chain is is now one of the big hurdles too. Um, we need. We expect to need about 5,000 zero emission heavy duty trucks by 2025 and more than 10,000 by 2030. Uh, and not just trucks, all new cleaning vehicles, for example, should be zero emission too. And all the current projections suggest that there will not be enough zero emission freight vehicles on the road by 2030 or 2050. So let me use this opportunity for a plea. Please accelerate your production uh, because by accelerating your production, you avoid that governments slow down in their ambitions uh, because of fear of not having enough uh, vehicles. Maybe this is what I could uh, tell you uh, for now. Yeah, Minister, I mean, really interesting that, 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 I mean, crucial, the role of cities really interesting, right, as a key uh, sort of nectar play yeah. off, often ahead of the rest of society and, and, and just the clarity of the science, right? If we've got to get to 2050, we know what the life cycle is, boom, it's what's, yeah. what, what's to argue about. Um, Simple. Just, just your last point about the pace of change for heavy vehicles. I know with the, um, Transport Decarbonisation Alliance, you, you've launched this idea of a global MOU to land at COP26. You just say a little bit, you know, and of course in Europe, all the manufacturers have agreed to 2040 phase out, but is, is, do I understand right that your ambition is to make that kind of a global, and to say a bit about the progress you've made on that and what your hopes are for COP26? Yes, absolutely. Um, if you look at freight emissions, they are really on the rise. And at the same, same time, there really is growing momentum to let's say come together and, and bolster the commitments. So uh, what we want to do is need to send a clear signal to the market, a strong collective, collective signal to the market, because I think that in turn will again advance technology innovation, generate clean energy jobs, et cetera, et cetera. 
Um, so we have launched this process to come to a global MOU on zero emission freight uh, that we would indeed love to be signed at the COP26 by the largest group of, of signatories possible, of course. Um, and we were very much inspired by, by what's happening in California and China also in this segment. Um, so my ambition is that this global memorandum will align leading nations around ambitious targets for zero emission, medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, and we have in mind a floor target of 30% of those new vehicles being zero emission by 2030 and 100% by 2040, while of course always encouraging nations to be even more ambitious. Um, and to, uh, to ensure this, uh, to try to come to this biggest group as possible, we'd like to welcome you to a special event uh, at the Clean uh, Energy Ministerial uh, that will indeed convene leading countries to voice uh, their support and reflection on the building block of, blocks of such a global MOU. So I really hope that we can come together with as many people as possible and ensure that we have a very ambitious uh, memorandum of understanding at the COP um, to send a strong signal to the world market. Uh, uh, Minister, would that be just countries or countries and vehicle manufacturers joining together? Well, I think it's crucial to have both um, right. because we need, it's like I said, it's the chicken and egg and the nest. Um, we need to we need to know that there are sufficient companies producing sufficient vehicles for government to set sufficiently high targets. Uh, if I go to parliament with a very high target and one of my opposition member shows me, shows me uh, a report saying that nowhere near that amount of vehicles will be produced, then of course it's very difficult for a government to set that ambitious target. So we need each other. I fully understand and appreciate that companies need this kind of statements from government to, to uh, go to their shareholders uh, and explain why they need to invest in speeding and scaling this up. And at the same way, we need to go to our shareholders in parliament. Uh, we need to be able to show them that this can be done, that the vehicles will be there, and let's here again, it's a question of uh, joining hands. And the, the larger the group is of countries that is willing to say, okay, we're gonna go that way, the stronger the signal is to industry. And the stronger the signal is to industry, the more the costs will go down and the easier it will be for all of us to meet our targets. And there is no alternative. There is only, there is one date that we have set our signature to, and there is only one route to go. Um, so let's please go there together as fast as we can, delivering benefits every day, Every day that we deliver those benefits sooner, it's more benefits for all of our citizens. Right, well, thank you. We're, we're, we're certainly going to, I like that idea of the chicken, the egg and the nest. We're going to hear from, um, obviously, a vehicle manufacturer, fleet owner and charging infrastructure provider um, later. Um, Minister Van Velden, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for your leadership and thank you for your insights into the process and, 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 and the, just the straightforwardness of it. Let, let's, let's turn now to Minister McLean from the UK. Um, well, welcome, Minister. Um, you know, you've also, um, as the UK Minister, set some very ambitious targets with the recent, or well, not so recent now, but last year announcement of a 2030 target to phase out combustion um, engine vehicles in 2035 for hybrids. Just, t just tell us a little bit about uh, about how you got there, and just for those who don't haven't been following this obsessively, like like many of us, I'm sure. Um, just a story from, from no date to 2040 and then to 2030 in quite a short space of time. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Nigel. And it's a real pleasure to take part in this. And also, uh, we fully agree uh, with the Minister from the Netherlands about a lot of the themes and, and the priorities that she's emphasised. And of course, uh, she and I have discussed this uh, together before. So it's a real pleasure to, to be appearing together on, on these vital issues. Um, so, Nigel, as, as you say, this is not a sudden announcement. Uh, we first set it out in 2016, uh, but we've always been clear that we wanted to go further and faster if we could. And um, obviously, we then received the backing of, of the British public. Uh, we had an electoral mandate to, to speed this up. But we did work hand in hand uh, with, with the industry uh, to, to achieve this result as well. Uh, as you will recall, we became the first major global economy to pass legislation requiring us to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. And in the UK, we have an independent group of advisors, the Climate Change Committee, and they actually recommended that we needed to go faster on curtailing emissions from road transport because cars and vans represent a fifth of, of the UK's domestic CO2 emissions. So uh, we consulted extent, extensively with industry and very much as uh, the Minister for the Netherlands has said, it is about working hand in hand with, with industry. Uh, we it, we um, 
invited views on the phase out date, the definition of what should be phased out, what were the barriers, the impact of these ambitions on different sectors of industry and society, and also the measures that were required to achieve the earlier phase out date. And what we've seen is that improvements in electric vehicle battery and charging technology and its commercialization have made an earlier phase out date feasible. On top of which we have committed significant investment and supporting policy measures from government, including our grants for plug-in vehicles and measures to support charge point infrastructure at homes, workplaces, on residential streets and across the wider road networks. I mean, I think as you will recognize the environmental prerogative for this transition is increasingly strong. And there is a consensus now in the UK around the need for ambition. That's why our policy measures have reflected that so far. Um, great, let, 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 I'd love to hear a little bit more about that that consultation process and the conversation, because because this is a complicated transition, right? The UK has got a lot of, you know, it's got a, a lot of vehicle manufacturers who are gonna have to retool. Um, uh, just say a little bit about the different kind of issues you were hearing from. I mean, I remember um, even some of the oil and gas majors were saying go earlier, which mm. is surprising. What, what, just, what, what are the, some of the things you had to trade off in terms of going early and, and, a, and a cost of transition versus going late? And what were what some of the different considerations in, in that conversation? Yeah, I mean, you can imagine that there were a wide spectrum of views when we first started this work, but we did take that that promise to work closely with industry very, very seriously. So along with Secretary of State uh, for, for uh, former Secretary of State for Bayes, uh, was then now COP president, of course, and also the Transport Secretary and myself, we held a number of very involved discussions with industry, with business, uh, with academia, with environmental groups, NGOs, of course, our devolved nations, uh, local government, and also consumers. And there's a spectrum of views across these different groups, but we needed to make sure that we listened carefully to all of them. Um, we, we know that uh, government actually making legislation will support mass adoption of, of Zeds, ZEVs, and that policy signal that we have sent by committing to that 2030 day has really catalyzed a huge amount of change and innovation actually in the, in the vehicle manufacturing sector. Uh, we've seen some really, uh, re really sort of forward leaning announcements just recently. Uh, from manufacturers including VW and Daimler who are accelerating their electri electrification plans. And I think we're seeing a growing level of confidence now uh, from consumers and businesses. So um, we're doing a lot of work around fleets. Uh, we know that those are pivotal for helping to drive demand for zero emission vehicles because we know fleets and leasing companies purchase over 50% of new vehicles. And of course, one of the barriers that always comes up, of course, is the charging infrastructure, which is why we have got this £1.3 billion uh, fund uh, resource set aside to accelerate the rollout of charging infrastructure. And we're working through that in a, in a massive amount of detail now. And we're also working in forums like, like this. We, of course, are part of this EV100 campaign, and that does target businesses to sign up to global commitments. Uh, including conversion of fleets to electric vehicles and supporting the uptake of EVs by staff and customers. And of course, the work that you're doing, Nigel, is, is really essential to this as well. Um, really interesting, that factoid that more than 50% of vehicles are fleet purchases, where, of course, the total cost of ownership tends to be more of a factor than for sort of retail purchases so so even with a maybe a higher ticket price the fact that electric vehicles are much cheaper to run and maintain um what's your sense of where the retail market is at in terms of that that kind of equation of cost versus adoption and, and how, 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 do, how do you think about um supporting that transition in that part of the market or do you let the fleets lead and then expect retail to follow well, we, of course, we have focused on the retail market and we have a number of levers that are available to us for that, including obviously the grants for the home vehicle charging points, the plug-in car grant as well, uh, which has now been going over 10 years. And we recently refocused that actually to uh, target those uh, vehicles that are lower in price and to, to really sort of put taxpayers' money behind where it's going to have the most impact, if you like, people on, on lower income looking to buy right. an EV. Um, so, and, and you know, you'll know also that the sales of, of EVs, I think we've just recently reached uh, half a million, uh, which we will, we were expecting to reach that figure this week. And demand has 
has absolutely skyrocketed, even in the lockdown period. We've seen that demand for EVs really accelerating. I think one in 10 uh, vehicles sold in the most recent statistics had a plug. So it, it, people are, are switching to EVs, they're understanding actually that the total cost of ownership is a massive uh, benefit for them. And of course, if you're buying a company car as well, uh, you'll get that benefit in kind. And also they're starting to really see the reality of owning an EV. And I think the range anxiety is something that we talk about a lot. When you actually buy an EV, you, what you realize is that you're charging it at home, you, you're, charging it, you're charging it in your sleep, which you can't do with a petrol <laughs> car. There's massive advantage there actually. So people are starting to see that. And some of these sort of, if you like, some of the myths about the range anxiety are starting to be addressed and that's driving consumer adoption. We're seeing more and more kind of consumer facing journalists and consumer facing organizations going into this into this money into this um sector now even we've got the extreme e uh formula formula one racing so all of these factors i think are going to move people's minds towards a, an ev actually i'm glad you mentioned extreme me one of them um you know, I, I, I'm very excited about my role and feel very honoured to do it. But I have to admit that one of the most exciting moments was when the Race to Zero logo appeared on all of the Extreme E um, drivers' um, racing suits. Um, uh, uh, so I thought that, 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 that that's an idea really gone mainstream. Just, just, just last question, um, Minister McLean, before we end. Um, Ten years ago, this conversation would probably only have been with environment ministers. Um, we're talking about industrial transformation. And so inevitably, there's... Uh, an economic competitiveness strand to the decision making just just help us a little bit how, you know how, as, a, as a as a minister and a government which is not just thinking about reducing emissions but is also thinking about jobs and competitiveness how how does how do you factor that into the decision making around such a big decision as a complete phase out of combustion engines yeah, of course, it's massive, especially for I'm a West Midlands MP and our region has been built on the automotive sector. It's vital for so many jobs. And that's why a lot of the, the resources that we've put behind this announcement have been into the to the automotive sector. Um, we've been thinking about the supply chains. How does that industry adapt? We've targeted a lot of our R&D spend towards those uh, early technologies that, that are going to be able to sort of take off and, and develop the technology uh, faster. And, and of course, we have got also support for um, a gigafactory, which we definitely need. We, we need to get the whole supply chain end to end in this country. Uh, that's a very pressing priority for the government and something that we're very much alive to. Great. Thank you. Um, well, Minister Van Feldhoven, Minister McLean, thank you. Thank you so much. So we've, we've, we've really uh, had very clear about the need for strong policy signals which are investable um and translating the science i mean actually at the end of the day that seems to be really quite simple if a vehicle is going to last 20 years and we've got to get to zero by 2050 then we need to um, stop producing them by 2050 thank you so much we're going to turn now from the government perspective to the other half of the ambition loop as we've described it the the role of business and i'm delighted now to be joined by three leading ceos from across the, the electric vehicle supply chain. I'm not sure who's the chicken, who's the egg, and who's the nest, to use Minister Van Feldhoven's analogy, but we've got um, Ola Kalenius, who's the CEO of Daimler, um, which of course, um, the group includes the, 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 the Mercedes-Benz brand, one of the world's leading vehicle manufacturers. We've got Christopher Burkhardt, who's the president of Charge Up Europe, which represents 13 charging infrastructure companies, and Dr. Frank uh, Apple, the CEO of Deutsche Post DHL, um, one of the uh, world's largest fleet owners and an early uh, committer to going going 100%. Let, let, let me start. Let me start with Ola. Ola, good to see you. Um, and um, we we just heard from the UK and Netherlands about their plans to decarbonise transport with clear end dates. And of course, Mercedes uh, was I think the first major OEM to actually set a zero date um, when you very soon after you took over as CEO a couple of years ago committed to 2039 as your net zero date for Mercedes. Just tell us a little bit about how much things have changed. That's only a couple of years ago, but we've heard about the UK going from 2040 to 2030. How's your view of how easy or difficult that goal will be? Has it changed? And in particular, with relation to the sort of develop policy development uh, in Europe and around the world? Well, hello, everybody. And Nigel, it's great to see you again. When we uh, put down the market with Ambition 2039, our logic was let's try to be 10 years ahead of the uh, Paris Climate Agreement so that we can uh, kind of 
uh, move into a zero position and also uh, respect what was discussed in the group before, thinking about the fleet that is already in the market, that you have to actually start earlier than 2050 if we want to get there as a complete economy by 2050. Uh, what's important also with the Ambition 2039, that it is a holistic uh, commitment. It's not just the product. People tend to think about make a bunch of electric cars and the job is done. It's more than that. It is the supply chain. It's our own production, but it's also the product in use. So where does the energy come from that then propels this electric vehicle or maybe in the case of a truck, a, a fuel cell uh, powertrain? How do I feel now two years on? Uh, I felt at the time that it was a groundbreaking statement and it felt a bit daunting. And, and of course, we don't have all the answers. It's a Herculean task in terms of the industrial footprint and everything that needs to happen to turn this industry into an, a net zero position. But I feel more confident than ever now. Uh, and my optimism has never been higher uh, that uh, perhaps 2039 from today's perspective, with the momentum that we're feeling in the market, technology-wise, of course, regulatory, uh, uh, where politics is going, that perhaps 2039 is now the most conservative scenario that we're looking at, at least as far as our company is concerned. Great. And so how does that, how does that actually, it's interesting, because if you're a first mover, right, and you go to 2039 and it's daunting, and then now you see General Motors, uh, 2035, Volvo, 20, 2030. How, how does that how does that land in in the company? I mean, it's obviously, a proud engineering company that's led many uh, many innovations in the in the sector since since the founding. How does how do how do people in the company? I mean, I, you know, I remember um, five years ago. You know, the the, the the you know Tesla was a bit of an annoying name for um, for, for for most <laughs> most existing manufacturing uh, manufacturers, but. Obviously, we're in a very different world now with this embracing of the need to get to zero. How, do, how does how does how does this affect the? You know, I often say engineers are going to save the world. I mean, how, how does the engineering heart of of Mercedes and Daimler react to the challenge you laid down and to the and to the accelerating change externally? I would uh, like to look at this from two perspectives inside the company uh, to make the announcement back then, 2039, 2039 actually released a lot of positive energy. Uh, this is the company that invented the automobile. This pioneering spirit is in our DNA. So take on a challenge and have the attitude that you're going to be an architect of the future. That's something that comes natural to the engineers working at Mercedes. Uh, so that was uh, a positive uh, reaction across the board. And I think for us in the marketplace, if we're going to win this game, not just for the planet, but also as a company, it's all about innovation, technology and speed. We just recently uh, presented our flagship car, the EQS, the fully electric sibling of the S-Class, uh, which received some tremendous feedback from, uh, from the customer in terms of what, what we've already achieved now. And I almost say as, as a joke inside the company, as spectacular as this vehicle is, it's gonna be the worst electric vehicle that we will ever make. Because from this point forward, everything that's coming is gonna be even better. So what we are doing now, it's, it's, it's a race to get ahead. Uh, our capital allocation has clearly moved in the direction now of uh, decarbonizing technologies and for co of course digitalization and all the other technologies that are driving uh, transformation. Uh, but, but now it's an engineering game. So that's, that's the company uh, perspective. Uh, but I think, and I was listening into the conversation with, uh, with the, the examples from the UK and Netherlands before I found out very interesting and I agree with a lot, if not all of what was said. I think we need to look at the, the whole equation. Uh, and I don't know what was the chicken, the egg or the <laughs> nest, but in our, in our view of the whole equation, we're talking about the product. We will take care of that. I'm confident about that. And actually politicians need not to worry that we're not gonna make the capital allocation towards zero emission vehicles. We will. Then we have the infrastructure piece. That's almost like a joint venture between politics and industry. We are involved in it ourselves. And then, of course, the third piece, uh, so, that, so that the whole thing comes together, is where does the energy source come from? And we have to synchronize the timeline of these three things. If, uh, if we just rush ahead with the product, but then the infrastructure lags, or we don't get uh, uh, the energy from a carbon neutral source, it kind of defeats the purpose of the exercise. So. Uh, now the capital allocation, the political decisions on, on, on those other two pieces, infrastructure and energy source, 
need to go hand in hand with the uh, uh, product uh, uh, investments that are made by the OEMs. And my feeling is that uh, many OEMs and definitely Mercedes, uh, we're gonna push ahead faster than we thought uh, only a couple of years ago. So, and so that, um, just a couple, just, a, just that just triggers a couple of thoughts over of, of um, parts of the whole, which, also are affected by a transition like this. I want to come back. So one I obviously think about is is jobs. This is a huge disruption in the whole supply chain. So let me come to that in a minute. But um, before then, you mentioned you mentioned the the energy system and the infrastructure. Of course, I guess before you know, in the world of combustion engine vehicles, Mercedes would never have got involved in the oil and gas infrastructure. Um, or that because it was just kind of there and it wasn't it wasn't it was seamless. So just say how how does that how much does that stretch a, a, a company like like Daimler to actually have to now start engaging in whole bits of the system which you could just take for granted before. Maybe you will in twenty years time be able to take for granted again. But as you say, in this transition, if they're not synchronized, how is that how has that stretched you as a leadership team? Well, we have always had good working relationship with the energy companies right. and maybe the utility companies have not been, uh, let's say, on the forefront, but, but they are now when it comes to uh, synchronizing our efforts in terms of infrastructure. And on the energy company side, we can see a lot of the uh, progressive, innovative uh, energy companies, uh, many of which are located in Europe, they're making moves uh, into alternative energy sources. And uh, if I just make one concrete example to illustrate what I mean about thinking this through to the end, and whereas you have made then an overall commitment, now we really have to look at it almost like an engineering task. We have talk, talked a lot about trucking lately. Mm -hmm. And we think trucking is, is a business that of course also needs to go zero emission. Uh, the sooner, the better. And it will be both battery electric vehicles and fuel cell electric vehicles. But take those two examples. If you've ever been to a truck stop, if I go to an average truck stop in Germany, and I look at what's going on there, you see maybe 100 to 200 trucks that are refueling at any, any point in time, and uh, some of the drivers are resting. If you want to do that in an example with only battery electric vehicle trucks, and they will have large batteries because they have to go long distances. Uh, a 200 kilowatt charging station is not going to do it. You, ideally, you would want to have a, a megawatt charging station. But think about just one truck stop in Germany, somewhere along the Autobahn, 101 megawatt charging stations, 100 megawatts. It's almost like you have to build a power plant next to this thing to make that happen without losing too much time, which is then cost uh, for the transport company. If you turn to the other case, you go and do it with uh, hydrogen, uh, then you could do it much quicker, almost like fueling up a car today. So you say, well, hydrogen is the solution that should work. And that's one of the reasons why we're betting on this uh, technology, especially for the long haul heavy trucking. But then the problem is moved or problem, let's say challenge moved to another place. How do we through electrolysis produce enough hydrogen to eventually propel not some tens of thousands of trucks, but hundreds and thousands or millions of trucks. And you look at the industrial task of that, and that also becomes quite daunting. If you want to get to that between 2030 and 2040, investment decisions have to be made now. And that's my point of this synchronization and thinking it through to the end so that we have the whole system working. Uh, and to your question, yes, we are deeply involved in discussions with the energy companies and the utility companies and some other players uh, that are going to help us as a transport mobility industry to reach this goal. Great, thanks. Oh, and, and last question. Um, you know, the, the 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 workforce, of course, in 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 German industrial law has a has a has a formal role in governance. Um, but it's not just your company; it's the whole. I mean, you 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 sit atop a whole value chain. How what what are the conversations like about the um, jobs and skills in the transition? Um, what are the what, what, you know? What, what, just just help us give us a sense of that conversation. On the engineering and research side, it's almost all positive because we're investing into new technologies. We're hiring, hiring software engineers. We're also reskilling, upskilling people to move maybe from uh, previous roles in the combustion uh, engineering uh, uh, space to, to now work on, on electrical drivetrains. And we have very smart people that quickly adapt. 
so on the engineering side, uh, skill-based side of this, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's actually quite a positive task. It's, it's a lot of work, but it's a positive task. Uh, what we have to realize though, is on the production side of the powertrain uh, uh, systems. So the workforce, the labor force that you need to assemble combustion engines, transmissions, and so on, is much larger than the equivalent that you have on an electric motor or battery system. So here we need to work with demographics uh, and other things to, to change that workforce. There will not be a one for one. So uh, to, to a degree, the inconvenient truth of this is that yes, a lot of, a lot of jobs in that particular side of the business will be lost. Uh, high skilled jobs will be gained in other areas, but not as many. So we have a task of uh, socially responsible transformation to do here in the next 10 to 20 years and use uh, the, uh, the, uh, the age structure of our workforce in those areas as best possible to, to get there. Great, Th thanks Ella for the, the very frank answer. And another argument for long-term policy clarity, right? So that um, society can manage the transition without making sudden decisions that, that lead to a lot more strands assets both economic and human thank you Ola, really great great um well let, 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 again let, let, let's turn now to to that that question of infrastructure particularly charging um christopher burkhart um you represent 13 charging infrastructure companies across the 27 european countries uh, with 300,000 charging points to date i think i've read that we estimate we'll need 3 million so 10x by 2030 you can um so tell us a little bit about how um how you go about that kind of pace of scale and what of, of change and what are the barriers to reaching that or are there any barriers or is it straightforward just to, how do you envisage that pathway to um the, the three million charging stations that um we need but, um i guess that's for passenger vehicles that doesn't that's not talking about the fuel cell infrastructure but that ola talked about yeah no thank you nigel no and it's very much about the uh the battery electric uh charging infrastructure that we need um First of all, maybe one word about um, Charge Up Europe. So we we were founded um, uh, last year in March, in March 2020, and actually ChargePoint, the company I work for and I'm on the executive management team for Responsible for Europe, was one of the co-founders together with EVbox and Allego. And there's a number of companies that have joined us since, uh, from utilities to oil and gas companies to uh, dedicated uh, sort of uh, uh, charging companies like ours. Um, and um, I think the, the fact that we exist and the fact that we decided to found Charge of Europe um, is a reflection of how important uh, it is that we built what Ola mentioned, which is this joint venture between politics and industry to really ensure that that acceleration happens and that it happens in the right kind of way. And I think, you know, um, everybody's here been talking about how many cars have come to the road. I mean, last year, uh, over 1.4 million EVs were sold. Uh, you know, the growth rates are 40, 50 percent a year, year on year um, over the over over the over the coming years. And obviously that begs the question as to, you know, um, how are we going to manage this sort of huge task of putting the infrastructure in place that ensures that as car manufacturers put the vehicles on the roads, those vehicles have infrastructure to charge at. I think the most important thing before I go into the barriers is to actually uh, repeat something that Minister McLean was saying, which is um, the fueling environment is changing drastically, right? So if we uh, look at a world today for internal combustion engines that is fueled by uh, effectively uh, uh, retail fuel stations or fuel stations at least, uh, in some case, you know, dedicated depot, depot fuel tanks, but mostly petrol stations. Um, and that that is obviously um, a an asset that has to be in the hands of those that sell and retail uh, uh, petrol fuels, um, the charging environment is very different, right? The car effectively, um, or the truck, as Ola mentioned during rest times, can effectively be charged while it's parked. And so that takes a lot of the traditional fueling kind of environment away um, from the need of the driver and puts the car into an environment where you can charge it at home, you can charge it at work. You can charge it at retail environments like supermarkets, like uh, car, any, anything that's really a car park. Same thing for fleets, where a lot of these vehicles will stand for a very long time. I mean, on average, a car stands over 90% of its time. So the amount of times that 
the traditional sort of infrastructure that we know from fueling will need to be used. The equivalent of a petrol station is a fraction of what it is today, but it's still an extremely important environment and an extremely important infrastructure in order to get people into those vehicles because you don't wanna be stranded when you drive long distance. You don't wanna be stranded if you don't have a driveway. You don't wanna be stranded uh, generally and you relate to the fueling environment that you know from the past. Now, um, as you mentioned, we've seen a rollout of hundreds of thousands of charging stations. And actually it's always difficult to put a number on this, even when you put targets out there, because you need to differentiate between charging stations at home, charging stations in semi-private environments or semi-public environments, and then public charging infrastructure, where I think most of public funding is rightfully so focused on a, and one of those three segments in a very differentiated way. And you almost need three numbers in order to come up to what you need as a whole. In terms of uh, the barriers that are out there, I think what we see today is that the, the, the speed with which um, you know, electric vehicles uh, generally, and when I say vehicles, I mean anything uh, that has four wheels or six wheels and that, and that, that, that uh, transports goods or people, you know, at that growth has really come on the back of uh, more of a patchwork sort of um, um, uh, a set of national rules. And I think that's one of the biggest obstacles. The, big, the biggest obstacle is, uh, you know, we need interoperability uh, for charging services to be rolled out across countries, uh, within countries and across countries. We need, um, we basically need technical rules that are harmonized. And I think the Alternative Fuels Infrastructure Directive, which is at the base of much of the infrastructure rollout is very outdated, has been poorly implemented. And I think that is one of the big challenges we need to address because you know, what it does is consumer prices get pushed up or become uh, intransparent when legislation isn't clear. Um, you know, the, the service quality suffers, which means that the, the driver experience suffers as a result, which mean, makes it more friction, uh, friction uh, it makes it more friction uh, or gives more friction to a driver uh, when they're trying to, uh, to, to now use that electric vehicle. And it gen generally hinders the capacity of our sector to expand. And the other two important pieces are the buildings. Uh, so the energy performance of buildings directive is being opened again. It was recently opened, it's being opened again. Why? Because we do need to ensure that we can get make ready into parking lots because parking lots play a huge role for electric charging infrastructure, but traditionally have not never been seen as a huge demand source for electricity. So that needs a massive uh, mindset shift. They also, by the way, need to be, um, need to be connected because charging infrastructure generally relies on connectivity, which means you need to get Wi-Fi, you need to get 5G into the parking spaces, into the parking lots, that's really critical. And the last one is, you know, uh, Ola gave some examples of sort of truck stops. Um, you know, our company in the US, not Europe, announced a big truck stop partnership, and we're, and we're working on the same thing in Europe, and so are the other members of Charge of Europe. The focus there is you need to get capacity to those sites, you need to ensure that permitting allows you to build the infrastructure that is needed and allows you to do so within reasonable time delays. Those are the kind of barriers, Nigel, that I think are really critical um, within that joint venture between politics and business that we need to get right. A really good example that there's a big difference between a bold target and the detailed technical policy required to ensure that the infrastructure gets built up. L last question. Christopher, we, we've, we've heard both from the ministers and from Ola about how a 2040 or 2039 target that felt difficult a few years ago starts to feel much, actually quite conservative now. UK has pulled that, that date forward by 10 years. Um, how can we make sure that we don't just obsess about 3 million in 2030 and are flexible enough to be able to ramp up even faster if the market keeps accelerating? Yeah, so, so interesting question. And I think, you know, I came out of the renewable space, so I'm used to the targets always being ultimately less ambitious than what industry and politics can deliver together. So the question is, how do we get there together? I think um, industry is ready. So I think we heard a lot about uh, from Ola about the car industry. And I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the proof is there, the vehicles are coming and the vehicles are coming in great numbers. Infrastructure typically attaches to the vehicle. Otherwise you have a, a bad case, a bad business case and, uh, and no real incentive, of course, uh, you know, government incentives always help, but ultimately you need to have the vehicles that attach to the charging stations. The biggest thing I think is one, 
is we've got a real opportunity with the national recovery plans um, to get the right amount of funding into electric mobility. So I think that will inspire consumer confidence. It will inspire industry confidence. I think if anything, what we've seen in the last 12 months is enormous amounts of money pouring into the electric mobility sector. Uh, our company just went uh, public recently. Other companies are going public in this space or being acquired. There's, there's big consolidation happen, happening. And if we can get uh, government funding to align with sort of what's happening in terms of accelerating the industry push from a financing point of view, then that's one really important piece. The second piece is we need to be really ambitious about uh, the alternative fuels infrastructure directive. As an association, as Charge of Europe, we recently sent a letter uh, to governments to basically call on a specific regulation, not a directive, a specific regulation uh, for charging infrastructure for electric vehicles. Electric vehicle charging infrastructure is no longer an alternative fuel. It's actually a mainstream fuel. It needs its own regulatory environment. And we kind of feel that, you know, now is the time to be ambitious for, uh, for the UK, for European governments across and for the European Commission to really put the infrastructure environment into place that we need. Fourthly, I think we need to be ambitious about the role of buildings and really think differently about parking lots and how parking is used. If you look at what's happening on the, uh, on the mobility space, there's lots of changes. As we transition to electric mobility, we're also more and more, go more, and more going to mobility as a service. I think those two kind of come together. Uh, you know, servicing of electric vehicles can happen in typical parking infrastructure. You don't need specifically uh, dedicated uh, service areas because most of it is light maintenance. There's a huge opportunity to rethink the parking infrastructure. And when you rethink parking infrastructure, you have to rethink buildings and the whole renovation wave that the Green Deal is supposed to uh, push. That's where there's opportunity for funding to go there and for the energy performance of buildings to be addressed. And then the last one really is around, you know, we need to create fast charge hubs, especially um, out of town that are capable of not just accepting vehicles, but that are capable of also catering for trucks that are uh, capable of catering for different fuel types from battery electric to traditional internal combustion vehicles to hydrogen. And we need to ensure that the permitting legislation is in place that allows us to do that quickly, that allows us to hit the timeframes we need to hit. And also, and this is equally important, that when tenders are issued for uh, concessions along highways for public concessions, that those tender procedures are open, uh, transparent, and, uh, and easily followable because you have a lot of new entrants as well in this space uh, that are looking at building out that charging infrastructure. And I think those are the four sort of key elements for us that are really critical in the build out. And we are very confident that that partnership between business and industry will happen, that business is ready, and that we will hit those milestones and not just that, that we can overachieve on them as well. Great, Th thanks Christopher. Um, it's great to hear from Ola that the product's gonna be ready from you, that the infrastructure's gonna be ready, the policy's gonna be ready. It's interesting you talk about being prepared to go faster. Um, also, the, also, I know that part of the advice from the Climate Change Committee in the UK included a macroeconomic assessment that going faster is better macroeconomically taken holistically as we've talked about. But let, let's turn now to a major user, a major um, fleet operator, Dr. Frank Apple at Deutsche Post DHL. Um, uh, Frank, good. thanks for joining us. Um, I, th I think you were one of the very early companies to join the EV100 initiative, which uh, Minister McLean talked about. I mean, but we've, we've heard from the you know, vehicle manufacturer charging company. Um, what is the role of the transport companies in driving this transition? Because if you weren't buying and using the vehicles, then there would be no transition. So just how do you see your role in uh, whether you're chicken or egg or nest in this systems change? Yeah, and Frank, you're on mute. So, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think, you know, the roads are pretty clear, you know, the, you know, whoever is supporting us in the transition, we need to generate demand first. Uh, because, you know, why should an OEM build electric vehicles if nobody buys them, then we don't need this charging infrastructure either. So, and we have done that now for more than a decade. We have the biggest last mile delivery fleet, I think, in the world with more than 15,000 electric vehicles. Most of them are manufactured by ourselves. 
or a startup because we couldn't find electric vehicles. We have learned everything. It's not rocket science. Therefore, I'm with Ola. So that the products will be ready, I have no doubt, because to build them is not rocket science. We created our own charging infrastructure in the last decade and learned a lot of lessons, you know, how you have to do that. We have no interest to continue both. You know, we don't want to become an OEM, nor we want to be an energy company. But we learned a lot uh, because we had the demand. We wanted to do that ourselves. So because we couldn't find something. So what is now going, what needs to happen is, and it's now happening, I think still not fast enough because we want to buy on an annual basis seven and a half, seven and a half thousand electric delivery vans on a global scale. So the products we will get from OEMs are not fully, you know, purposely built for our needs somehow and better for our competitors. I think that's something where we have to develop. It's more to the, in the next, more back end loaded than front end loaded. So that's a challenge. And how can we fulfill our demand? Diesels are still more better. Our charging infrastructure is also, as I said, not 100% there. Total, total cost of ownership is significantly higher still um, than diesel vehicles. And, and that has been quite painful in the last decade for us already, building them themselves and having higher cost than, than some of our competitors. But nevertheless, I'm equally optimistic as Ola and, and uh, Christopher um, to really uh, say, you know, if, as long as we don't get too tight regulation for the solution, which, you know, the politicians should not do. And I didn't hear that from the two ministers, the ministers today. You know, we have to generate the demand, coming back to your question, we have to generate the demand and we generated the demand. We are committed to have 80,000 electricity ve vehicles for the last mile until 2030. Um, so we have, and the demand should give them people business, you know, who wins will be not, you know, who has the lowest price, who wins is who is able to produce these vehicles for us and our competitors. And then we need charging infrastructure, which actually is for last mile easy because you can come back always to the same spot. For long haul, I have a slightly different perspective. Electric vehicles will not solve that. We need, um, you know, sustainable fuel alternatives somehow, which is not, you know, electricity. It is either a fuel cell or sustainable fuel fuel, but that probably will go first to the LM industry then before it goes to the trucks. But we need solutions through that long haul with questions like how you recharge the trucks, um, because it's different if you go point, point to point instead of going in circles and come back to the same place. So I think it's not just one solution. For last month, it's clear, stop and go, that's the best is electric vehicles. I have doubts that this is for the long haul the same. And that would be our request. But what I have to say as well, we see tremendous momentum now happening because we are not the only one who is demanding more electric vehicles for last mile delivery. And as I said, if we get the provide charging infrastructure. The last thing we should not forget other last mile delivery vehicles like trikes, uh, because we are using them already. And of course, that is a very good alternative for the inner cities. Um, because you know, if a, if a Korea is driving a bike or a trike you can deliver quite a lot of parcels as well. And are those, are those electrified as well? Yes, of course. I think otherwise, you know, you have to be Superman. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, and but Frank, just just look, it's very interesting that uh, Ola's talked about having to, as a vehicle manufacturer, get into charge, the charging business with some of the joint ventures there. You, you've talked about as a, as, a, as a delivery company having to get into vehicle manufacturing um, uh, and infrastructure. What just why did you do that rather than wait is that because it's a chicken egg nest situation someone's got to move first but what was your motivation back in 2019 to commit to going 100 electric before all the other pieces were in place yeah i i think you know the intention was originally and that is a piece which didn't work out that we thought that we might get a competitive advantage uh, either by the consumers who say you know we want to have somebody who provides us or customer even you know consumers and customer and I have to say the last decade has not proven that this is the case or that we at least get advantage by delivering in city centers. And we have not found any, at least in Germany, we have not found any city which gave us or put a toll in place for the diesel vehicles and we had a competitive advantage. So, and I think that would be something I would request as well from, from the policymakers they always should think about how do you create a competitive advantage? In our case, very simple. So 
uh, loading places for electric vehicles, which only can be used by electric vehicles, for instance, would make our service better, more convenient, uh, and probably more reliable as well, because we always will find a slot somewhere in the city. Access to pedestrian areas with electric delivery vans, only for those would be a competitive advantage for pickup of retail stores, for instance. These are all small things which would put the companies who are converting faster to a competitive advantage. We didn't get that at all. You know, we had no advantage to go to any city center in a German city with electric vehicles. We had cost disadvantage, but not an advantage because, you know, mayors didn't want to put tolls in for diesel vehicles. And that is a part where policymakers can help a lot, can, can help a lot, not by saying this is the right technology, we subsidize the technology. I think that's not a good answer. It's much better to make the traditional technique more expensive and not yeah. for the price of the vehicle, but for the usage of the vehicle, either by putting a higher carbon price up or by saying people put a toll on for every delivery van for the city and those who have an electric yeah. won't pay anything. And it doesn't have to be massive. You know, it would be two, three euros a day would already make change the game. And I think that would incentivize particularly smaller entrepreneurs to buy those because they will instantly get a benefit from that, not to pay that. They will probably complain that they have not to pay something. But you know, at the end of the day, consumers have to pay for, for the price of the carbon-free environment. So they have to push it then to their customers as yeah. well. But but if if the competition has a lower cost than we had for an hour decade. You know, we can't push it to consumers or yeah. to customers. So, and I think that is something where politicians should look at, you know, how do you give a favor to the people who are converting rapidly instead of, you know, driving on Sundays with trucks would be a massive advantage for those who drive electric trucks, for instance, because we would have an, uh, you know, better usage of our capacity, capacity on Sundays on, on sorting centers. Of course, we need them to find drivers and all this kind of stuff. So there are a lot of elements where you really can create a competitive advantage for those who are really uh, early adapters to the technology. Great, thank you. I think and great, great call to policymakers to think about things which are not necessarily fiscal instruments, but which tilt the playing field, not towards a te technology, but but give an advantage to the, dis the, the disruptors or the early movers. And certainly I remember when London um, committed to ultra low emission zone, one of the immediate things that happened was um, an army of small and medium-sized enterprises located outside London who were running delivery businesses into London made you know got in touch with the with, with the mayor and said well where you know where are we going to get the vehicles it was an immediate creation of a demand signal um, I'm just going to ask um, each of you um, a last question about speed because we've heard about how this is speeding up um, uh, so I'm going to ask you all. Let's just let's let's rather let's just take passenger vehicles or or, or, or some small and medium-sized vans. I guess to, what how fast could we go in Europe and in, in the world in terms of getting to 100% zero emission vehicles? We st start start with you, Frank, and then I'll go then I'll go to um I'll go backwards to Christopher and then and then to Ola. How fast could we go? Um, you know, if we if we could get everybody organised. Yeah, you know, I, I think this is always not the most important question because it then happens faster than you thought. You know, I think <laughs> we set un, unrealistic ambitions because the technology is not there, the supply is not there, then we only frustrate people. It's a little bit like the, the vaccination campaign in Europe. You know, Europe done a great job, actually. In, you know, we are still at the forefront. I know that there's a UK minister. You can argue, you know, how much uh, vaccine came from Europe and how much in Europe came from the UK. I would say the balance would be very clear. Uh, and I think Europe has done a great job. But what we have not done well is, you know, we have not communicated what is achievable in this time frame, and therefore we raised expectations which are not able to be delivered. And we knew that. We knew that, you know, there was not a single journalist who believed that we would have one third of the population vaccinated in Europe six months ago. Okay, Frank. So so and here's the same. If we now say we will be there in 20, 2035, people will say, then we will miss it. Then we say, oh, it was a disaster. So I think it's better to tighten the goal. I think we need market dynamics to find the answers. And we are, I think, on the right journey. We have our carbon price. We better increase this. If we find other mechanism which are market-based i think you know all i want to say cars or trucks all right i'm gonna say okay, okay right. i, 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 I tried to get i tried to get a date out of you i'm gonna try it i'm gonna try with christopher and ola and see, 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 see if, if if there is politics you christopher give me a can you give me, a, me how fast could we go so 
Um, so I think throwing around with dates is always dangerous, but I think the point is just, you know, it can go very fast. So on average, you know, vehicles, um, average age on the road is about 10 years, a little less uh, in some countries, slightly more in other countries. That gives you uh, some form of time frame. I think all I earlier said, 2039 was, was very conservative. I, I would agree with that uh, on behalf of our industry, at least. So I think that there's a time frame, and I think 2030 is a really critical date in people's minds. And I think it's really important to set objectives. To me, one of the most critical questions is, when do we stop selling internal combustion engine vehicles? Because setting that date um, triggers a lot of economic factors. For example, you know, uh, most cars in Europe are sold through vehicle leasing companies or some form of financing instrument. If the residual value of those vehicles of the internal combustion vehicles drop significantly, that will shift a lot of new demand into electrics. Uh, so that's a really critical uh, question for me is the date at which we stop selling internal combustion engine vehicles. All I mentioned the social responsibility of moving production over. I think that needs to be a big consideration as well as uh, the rush to, to electric. And then I think I said a lot about sort of time frames or not time frames actually, I said a lot about legislation uh, that is needed, uh, which needs to accompany the sort of industry push for vehicles and infrastructure. And we need realistically, uh, you know, to do a lot in the next three years to set that framework right, then set an ambitious target for the phase out of internal combustion engine vehicles. And then whether it's battery electric or hydrogen or whatever else doesn't matter, then it will go extremely quickly. So so that's that's the date I would, I would give. Thanks. Ola, any thoughts? If you look at the factors that can turn a technology or an industry into a position of exponential growth, and we can see that uh, happen in businesses in the past too, I think many of those factors are coming together now. Technology, regulation, financial markets, you know, where are the market caps, uh, customer adaption, and so on. So I think it's going to be faster than we think. But I think Frank made a couple of very good points. If we take his business, I mean, I would love to serve him up with even better products to make his business more successful. But if you indeed would decide that in cities, you have an advantage if, if you have a zero emission vehicle, which is something that we would support, by the way, then through policymaking and incentive, incentivization, you can actually decide the timeline much quicker. That is why a transformation like this regulation, thoughtful regulation and te technology and infrastructure really need to go hand in hand uh, and we're up right. for it uh, we're, right. we're going to take our we're going to take care of our piece promise right thank you well look, thank, th thank you all it's great to have a, a view from the different parts of the ecosystem and and a really confident sense that um, this is going exponential and if, as long as the conditions um, uh, around that exponential change are right it could go very fast indeed thank you thank you very much to all of you um, thank you um, um, so we've heard from government and, and industry about the opportunities and the challenges um, of the transition to zero emission vehicles. Now we're going to look at the specific context of that race in Germany. Of course, a very strong um, automotive sector, one of the top four manufacturers in the world. Um, companies across Germany are embracing the transition to electric or, or fuel cell. Um, Germany doesn't have a national phase out date like the Netherlands or the UK at the moment. So to explore that, we're going to um, talk to Sabina Nallinger, who's the CEO of Stiftung Zwei Grad, the Two Degree Foundation, um, and Rita Schwarzelur Zutter, who's the Parliamentary State Secretary at the Ministry for Environment, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety from the German government. So Sabina, if I could start with you, um, zooming in, in a bit on, on, on Germany, you work closely with politicians and businesses translating the science into actions, as we, we heard from, from um, Sincha at the beginning. Seeing how we need action from everybody across industry, what do you think we need to see from businesses and governments in the next few years? Yeah, thank you very much, Nigel, for the kind invitation and your warm introduction. Uh, for me, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, what a perfect timing for this year's Petersburg Climate Dialogue and to have uh, this discussion. We are at a historic moment in time, despite the corona pandemic and during an economic crisis. Support for climate action has never been bigger. The European Union, China, the US, all have set more ambitious targets. 
uh, the transition to a climate neutral economy is underway. And the, the colleagues on the previous panel, like Christopher, Frank, and Ola, have already shown their commitment and ideas how to make it work. Obviously, the goal of climate neutrality by 2050 cannot be achieved by turning a few screws here and there. Instead, fundamental change is needed in how we produce and how we do business. It is a race about technology, about competitiveness, about market share, about the jobs of the future. And with the European Green Deal, Germany is very well positioned to take a leading role in this race. As a country of engineers and innovators, our companies do want to be part of the solution. And however, the economic opportunities of this transition do not wait until 2030. The next 10 years will decide which region of the world will win the race for climate neutral industry. So as you know, last week, Germany has seen an exceptional ruling by the Constitutional Court of Germany. The ruling confirms what companies have been demanding for a long time. So we need more planning security for investments to make climate neutrality made in Europe the competitive advantage of tomorrow. Politics need to step up. What we need now is a green deal for Germany to finally strengthen implementation and uh, scale up investments. In a recent study we did together with Agora Energy and Roland Berger, we have identified three pillars for an effective policy framework which energy intensive industry need in Europe. First, reduce the risk of investing in low carbon breakthrough technologies such as steel production based on green hydrogen. Second, create market advantage for climate friendly products through a mix of incentives and regulation. And third, ensure that the backbone of this transformation can be supplied. What we need is sufficient quantities of renewable energy at competitive prices. So these are the key pillars of a policy framework for a carbon neutral industry. So let me be clear, with such a framework, the transformation will not work. But I'm very confident all of us on this panel want to be part of the solution. So I would say, let's get to work. Thanks, Sabina, and, and very clear and interesting. You mentioned both the recent court case, which of course brings together industrial strategy um, and, the, and the rights of future generations, also the importance of the investment climate. And I mean, everyone will have seen that a couple of weeks ago with Mark Carney, we launched the Glasgow Financial Alliance for Net Zero with 160 asset owners, asset managers, and banks with $70 trillion of assets committing to net zero. And just the, straight away, Moody's issued a statement saying that would lead to a squeeze on credit for heavy emitting companies without plans. So Sabina, you, of course, we've been talking to major actors in the mobility market, but you work across industry. Could you just give us a flavor of what does the business community more broadly in Germany think about this transition to zero emission vehicles and the pace of change? Yeah, so recently there is a very strong push for zero emission vehicles in Germany. Within four years, the registration of all electric vehicles have increased almost sixfold. And these numbers keep increasing significantly as a result of last year's economic stimulus package. So some car makers have seen an increase of almost 200%. You can see this in Berlin, Munich, or any major German city. More car makers, more different models, more car sharing, and more charging stations. But let me be clear, climate neutrality cannot be achieved by a lot of zero emission vehicles alone. It is about charging infrastructure, about sufficient renewable energies at competitive prices, about production chains, about new concepts for mobility, cargo and logistic, and last but not least, about redesigning our cities. 
this is really a complex endeavor where a lot of different actors need to work together. I take a lot of optim optimism from looking at our foundation Stiftung Zweigrad. Within the last two and a half years, the number of companies that support our cause has not only doubled, but the new companies are not the usual suspects, say the natural winners of the energy transi transition. Instead, we do see companies joining us from energy intensive industries such as steel, cement, Cooper, and obviously from the mobility sector. So next to Trexelmeyer and Phoenix Contact, two of Germans leading suppliers for electric vehicles, the German parcel service DHL as a global logistic company have joined us recently. So these are companies for whom sustainability and decarbonization pose enormous challenges of their business models and production processes. If these companies join our mission, we are finally moving into the right direction. But there's another untapped potential. Germany companies as users and customers have a major influence on demand. Over 60% of all car new car registration in Germany are intended for company fleets. However, the portion of zero emission vehicles in this fleet is still very low, less than 10%. Fully electrifying these fleets by 2030 holds enormous growth potential for the German car industry. So together with the Federal Ministry of, uh, for Environment, Agora Verkehrswende and ENBW, one of Germany's leading utilities, we are working on specific proposals for solutions on how to leverage this potential. For the Foundation to Decree, I can say that there is no other topic that energizes our companies more than the switch to climate neutral business model. And thus, we are very proud that a front runner group of our companies have joined the UN race to zero. And we are very optimistic for more companies to join in the near future. As I said at the beginning, we are at a historic moment in time. The transition to a climate neutral economy is unstoppable. The race to zero mission is on and make no mistake, German companies are working hard to win this race. Great, thank you, Sabina. And a good shout out for all those fleet owners to join the EV100 initiative. And also uh, like the, the point you make about just what a systemic transformation this is. And like Ola said, if you want net zero cars, it's not just the powertrain, it's also the steel that has to be net zero. So let, let me talk now, uh, to, uh, with Minister Schwarzlöhr Zutter. Um, uh, Minister, um, we know that Germany is one of the most important automotive countries in the world. And so very important whenever we have a conversation about this transition. What, um, what's been done to date and what are the commitments and actions and what are your ambitions for the future in terms of the role of Germany in driving this transition? Yeah, hello, Nigel. Uh, German, uh, Germany has... Um taken comprehensive um, climate action uh, measures. And the Climate Action Plan 2050 establishes important goals and guidelines, which uh, were specified by the Climate Action uh, Program 2030. And for the first time, sectoral um, targets have been imposed to achieve the necessary emission reductions. And what's more, they have been legally binding. I think that's very important by the Climate Change Act. And by 2030, emissions from the transport sector are to be reduced by 40 to uh, 42 percent uh, compared to 1990. And a range of measures have been taken to promote uh, electric mobility. And they have already started to take effect because I think uh, the market alone doesn't work. So in 2020 alone, around 400,000 electric uh, vehicles were newly registered in Germany, despite the COVID-19 pandemic. And this means we were able to almost triple the fleet over the course of one year. In 2021, in this year, we expect to see an even greater number of electric uh, vehicle registrations. And one key reason for this is uh, um, for this are the EU's uh, CO2 uh, fleet limits. Uh, 
a regulatory policy. Since uh, 2020, manufacturers have uh, had to significantly reduce their CO2 emissions. This is why they placed more and more electric vehicles on the market. The German government has supported this development through incentives and environmental um, bonus and also an innovation uh, premium. And uh, the charging infrastructure was, uh, was a very uh, important factor. All panelists uh, talked about and by 2031 million public uh, charging uh, points are to be set up in Germany and we aim um, for at least 50,000 by 2022. In November 2019, the German government adopted a charging infrastructure master plan and set up a national coordination center uh, for its implementations. And since uh, 2017, the German government has been assisting municipalities, public institutions, businesses, and private individuals in setting up charging points. So they, they also, there are incentives. And uh, I think uh, that's very important. The German uh, government is supporting private charging infrastructure with a total of 400 million euros. If I would, uh, I plan uh, to, to, uh, to have a charging point, then I get uh, uh, 900 euros of, uh, as an incentives uh, to, uh, to build it. So I think um, that's very important, the incentives. And we have some uh, pilot projects. Uh, we have um, some um, trolley trucks. Uh, we, we also regard uh, the, the uh, heavy traffic, uh, the heavy tra uh, transport, and we support uh, municipalities um, in their public um, uh, transport. Uh, we support them with uh, um, electric buses. So uh, I think uh, we don't look only to the PV, we also look to the transport, um, uh, heavy transport, and also to the public uh, transport. Great. Thank, uh, thank you, Minister. I think. Um, it's great that, that, that very strong agreement for everybody that it, you, it's about empowering the market, not leading it to the market, that we need strong regulation. And I think I heard you say one million charging stations in Germany alone. So that's a, that sounds like more than your fair share of three million. So that sounds really positive. Just, just, to, just to finish, we're, we're six months away from COP26. Um, and um, what, what can and should we expect to see from businesses and policymakers so that by the time we get to Glasgow, there's a very strong sense that this transition is inevitable, that we're all committed to getting to zero. What can we do by Glasgow in six months time? I think, uh, I hope uh, Europe will continue to give uh, strong and even accelerated uh, momentum to climate action. And happily, we were able to reach agreement in the council during uh, our German uh, pres uh, council presidency on raising the 2030 climate attempt from 40% to 55% uh, reduction of greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And this addition was recently reinforced in the trilogue uh, with the Commission and the European Parliament. So we need to continue on the path towards the decarbonization of transport. Electrification is the key factor here and this is why we support the initiative of the UK uh, as the incoming COP uh, presidency to issue a road statement by the most important car markets uh, through newly uh, created uh, zero emission um, um, emissions uh, vehicles transition council um, to advocate this transformation and we are glad uh, that the ministry for economic affairs uh, represented germany in the uh, recent second council meeting and then hope to also partici participate in the third meeting which will able place around the national election and i i'm hopefully heard uh, from the manufacturers and also uh, from the demand side uh, that they are uh, on the way to be more ambitious that we get uh, our uh, climate uh, goals. Right, thank you, Rita. Yeah, it seems to be a rare example where everybody is agreeing that we need to be more ambitious, but perhaps with a bit of caution to make sure we do it in the right way, but nobody's saying slow down. Because um, it's, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned the Minister of Econ Economic Affairs joining that council. This is not just about environment or just about industry. It's about the whole economy. So thank you. Thank you so much, Sabine. And thank you, Minister um, Schwarzenegger-Ritter. 
for joining us. Um, I'm going to turn now to a um, good friend and one of the real drivers of change in this agenda, Helen Clarkson, CEO of the Climate Group, um, founder of the EV100 initiative and driver of that very successfully over the years, um, and also recently pulling together the whole agenda really under the Route Zero initiative. Um, Helen, I'm going to hand over to you to, to close us out with some closing reflections on what we've heard and maybe uh, you know some of your thoughts about what we might be able to achieve and should focus on on the road to Glasgow. Yeah, Over thank to. you. Thank you, Nigel. It's been a really great event. And um, apparently I can just sum up in three words. So chicken, egg, nest, right? I think we had that. I actually think it's a really great analogy. I was, I was thinking about it. And, you know, you start with something that seems really simple, but then when you start to ask questions, you get really into complexity. So, you know, with the EV challenge, it sounds simple. And Secretary of State Van Veldhoven said, you know, you start with the Paris Agreement, and then you just work back and you, you know, you make a plan. Um, and when you do that, you can see that we've got to get rid of the combustion engine as quickly as possible and, and no new combustion engines by the end of the decade. But when you start to unpack that, I think we've really heard from all our different speakers that you run into complexity. This is really system change. Um, and as a parliamentary state secretary, Schwarzenegger Sutter just said, the market alone doesn't work. So it's not enough to just push to one bit of the system and say, you sort it out. It's about deliberate, system-wide change um, and I think we've heard a lot this morning about different um, parts of that so thinking about governments and their role in setting end dates you know translating the Paris Agreement into when do you need to do what thinking about how you do things like build things like um, we heard about tenders you know putting zero emission buses into to tenders but then you need to coordinate with other government and then um, also hearing you know it's not just Europe needs to do this. It's really a global issue. And that's why markets like Europe have got to go as fast as possible because then we've got to, uh, to push it out. So hearing also then from the UK about how setting that end date, it's a critical moment when you set that end date, it really catalyzes change, it catalyzes innovation, it grows confidence in the manufacturing um, sector and starts to be clear with markets about what's happening and the change that we need. So in terms of that system shift, starting with that end date, um, really a crucial um, step. And then listening to the private sector and how that same thing works for them. So again, setting that end date and hearing from Daimler about putting that 29, 2039 date. And as you said, you know, that looks really ambitious when it came in and now others have come in ahead of that. And then saying, well, actually, you know, we, we think we can get there ahead of that. And, you know, as a climate group, we wanna run our hundreds campaigns, which are all about these 100% commitments and we found with those are the companies we work with that when you put that end date in and you put it at 100 percent or at zero that really drives change within companies because it sends a signal to the company that's everyone that needs to make that change and that leads to innovation that can allow us you know to hit these targets ahead of time but i think it was really interesting to start to unpack what that system shift is about so product infrastructure the energy in production that's used hearing so much more about that charging infrastructure. And it sounds, again, sounds really easy. And, you, and I think, you know, the domestic market, you start to see charges on houses or on lampposts, but starting to talk about what it's going to look like for freight, uh, you know, hearing about cars aren't really moving anywhere 90% of the time. So you can use different parts. It becomes a different thing than we're used to with refueling. But that also means you need these joint ventures with governments and with businesses. Um, and we heard from DPA, uh, DHL that transport companies aren't waiting for the solutions. They're creating their own charging infrastructure, their own manufacturing. Um, but all of this is about a really much more fundamental shift. It's not just, and we heard that from so many speakers, it's about the electric car. It's not going beyond that and thinking about that and saying, can policymakers do more? How do they level the playing field? How do they set different ideas around policy? This idea of, you know, could you just have freight on Sundays or whatever that thought was? You know, so it's interesting to think about how this change is going to happen. It's going to happen very quickly. And we just heard from obviously the German context where there isn't a phase out date yet, but a lot of work going on in such a critical uh, market and how this leadership is going to happen. So, you know, all of that makes me quite optimistic. I'm an optimist by nature, um, but I think we're seeing this very fast transition in this sector. And we know that it's not a question about if, it's about when. And it's clear, Alok Sharma said it right at the start, the future of the road transport sector is clear. And it's also clear that there are going to be winners and losers. And we've had a bit of um, detail on that today, but I think what's interesting for me in all of this is, you know, 
people bandy around concepts like creative destruction and you know of course you know winners and losers but actually you know at the company level I always say why are you assuming you're going to be Netflix and not Blockbuster you know you need to think about this understand the direction set those targets and get out behind it and we're seeing huge rapid shift but obviously we need to do more and the faster we can go and the higher scale we can get uh, you know the better so we're very excited to be partnered um, with the UN High Level Climate Champions, and we launched recently, you know, in partnership, the Race to Zero, coming together with others, launching um, the Route Zero, which is a global platform to showcase and call for more ambition on zero emission vehicles as we get into COP26. So really excited to be working on that together, and I'll leave you there. So commitments, absolutely critical, but just the start of this really exciting system-wide shift that we need to see. Thank you, Hal. That's a beautifully wrapped up. I, lo I love, you know, it's like the, the the a great way of thinking about getting an exponential change wrong is why do you think you're Netflix when you might be Blockbuster? Um, and thank you for all of your work so, um, supporting and, and driving the race to zero. And I think particularly, um, you know, embodying this, this, this approach to systems change. If we've heard anything today, it's how complicated it is, as you say. And so really excited that the route zero is not just focusing on one aspect, but pulling together all sorts of partners to drive the transition. Um, and really looking forward to working with you and with all of our um, great panelists in the, uh, the months ahead to make sure that this is part of the race that really is seen to be accelerating and that we're winning collectively by the time we get to Glasgow. So with that, um, I'd like to thank a, a fantastic group of guests for being so frank and sharing their experiences and their thoughts on this transition for this satellite event of the Petersburg Climate Dialogues exploring the race to zero emission vehicles. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>